Hola, buenos días y buenas tardes a quien corresponda según el lugar del mundo donde se encuentren. Soy Salim Fayad, cofundador de la Fundación Otro Sur y codirector de la MUICA, muestra itinerante cine africano en Colombia, que en este momento está atravesando su cuarta edición en 2021 y que a través de su programación, de su contenido y de, este, de estos eventos virtuales quieren unirse a las, a las voces de los movimientos que en este momento están tan activos en Colombia, en estos momentos eh, tan delicados. Los saludos de Sudáfrica. Desde aquí he estado basado desde 2008, trabajando como gestor cultural, corresponsal y fotógrafo. Y hoy estaremos conversando con Jesse Sin y Sara Gubella, directoras del cortometraje documental Como el Agua, y con Kurt Orderson, que se conecta desde Baltimore, que es el director de la película del documental No en mi barrio. Ambas películas hacen parte de la programación de la MUICA 2021 y se pueden ver durante todos los fines de semana del mes de mayo en eh, Bunet. Co. Antes de continuar, quiero presentarles también a Jason Pianda, quien nos estará apoyando en la traducción. Bueno, presento primero entonces a Sara. Sara Gubella es nacida en Lisboa y es una galardonada cineasta y fotógrafa. Su documental Mama Guma ganó el premio al público al mejor documental en Sudáfrica en el Festival de Cine Tricontinental de 2011 y se proyectó en festivales en todo el mundo, incluida la muica. Sara ha trabajado como escritora, directora y directora de fotografía en comerciales, campañas en línea y documentales y cortometrajes para diferentes clientes y tra ha trabajado también haciendo videos musicales. En sus películas, Sara explora la línea donde lo imaginario y lo real se tocan y el espacio entre el consciente y el subconsciente. También concibe el cuerpo como una forma de expresión y ha desarrollado proyectos con bailarines a lo largo de los años, incluyendo el documental The Sound of Masks o La Danza de las Máscaras que presentamos en la Muica 2019, y que explora la historia de Mozambique a través del legendario bailarín Atanasio Nyusi. En la Muica 2021 presentamos su cortometraje documental Like Water, o Como el Agua, sobre un dojo de karate en un township de Ciudad del Cabo. Y este documental lo codirigió con Jesse Sin. Jesse es una cineasta de Ciudad del Cabo, Sudáfrica, y su trabajo se centra en las narrativas impulsadas por mujeres de la tercera edad. Y como cineasta tiene experiencia en ficción y contenido de no ficción, y su trabajo a menudo cruza las fronteras entre los diferentes géneros y está comprometida con la realización de películas éticas y colaborativas que interactúan activamente con los participantes que están frente a la cámara y actualmente Jesse dirige su primer documental The Home y es candidata a un MFA en la Universidad de Stanford Kurt Orderson es un galardonado cineasta también de Ciudad del Cabo, Sudáfrica y su carrera comenzó luego de completar sus estudios de cine y televisión en la Universidad de Monash en Sudáfrica en 2004 ha dirigido 11 largometrajes documentales filmados entre los cinco continentes, así como más de 20 cortometrajes. Y sus películas sirven como una pedagogía creativa al hacer uso de tradiciones históricas, políticas y de solidaridad transnacional. Su trabajo explora historias desconocidas, haciendo preguntas críticas para crear nuevas narrativas. En 2009, Kurt fundó Asania Rising Productions, una productora que consta de un colectivo de cineastas y activistas que crea contenido cinematográfico y mediático que facilita la unidad, la solidaridad y las nuevas alianzas y estimula también el discurso público. Y su documental No en mi barrio, que es su más reciente largometraje, se ha proyectado en más de 25 festivales de cine en el mundo y lo presentamos este año en la programación de La Muica. Entonces, bueno, para empezar la conversación quería empezar preguntándoles a bueno, las directoras y a los directores y podemos empezar con Sara y con Jesse que nos cuenten un poco del contexto en el que se desarrollan sus documentales. Sara y Jesse, ¿por qué contar esta historia? ¿Por qué les interesó esta escuela de karate en los Cape Flats? Y a la larga para el público que no está muy familiarizado con el contexto sudafricano, ¿qué son los Cape Flats? So, I mean, in terms of, uh, of this specific film, uh, so I actually, I read about, I read an article about this, this specific sensei quite a few years ago. It was on the newspaper and I was intrigued by it because I'd never heard, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that this 70 year old woman was teaching karate. You know, I'd never heard this story. It's not the sort of story that you hear coming out of the Cape Flats. Um, and then uh, what happened was that there was a call for funding for short films that were looking at sports as um, spaces for communities and upliftment. Uh, and that's when Jesse and I sat down and we're like, well, maybe this is actually a good opportunity to try and tell this story. Uh, so that's, that's when we got together and we went to the school for the first time. 
and we met uh, well to the dojo and we met the sensei and on that very first day that's also when we met noir the little girl that's in the film it just so happened that it was her very first lesson <laughs> she had never been there before um, and she just she had such a such a beautiful personality um, and I think it's maybe because she didn't really have much discipline yet from karate she was just kind of doing her own thing and Jesse and I felt there was something quite beautiful and quite fresh about about that innocence that she brought into a space like that um, so that's kind of how it started uh, we then obviously started looking into the history of the dojos in in the in the Cape Flats, and um, I mean, this one, this one in specific, started in the 70s. The sensei started karate in the 70s, and then her husband, who was also her coach, passed away, and she then took over the dojo and she carried on the legacy. Um, and and this was this this. I mean, during the height of apartheid, it's, this these spaces became very strong. Um, hubs for for well for children actually children and young boys and young girls well maybe more boys back then um so it was a safe space a safe haven but also a place where they could learn discipline they could learn um resilience uh to deal with all the hectic stuff that was happening around them uh so i think once we started looking into the history of the dojo itself and also the sensei being who the sensei is um it's kind of, you know, propellers to want to tell this story. Uh, we did want to have Noir um, in the film uh, as sort of the protagonist, just because she could bring in this sort of young energy into that space and we could follow her journey a little bit. So she's kind of, you know, taking in all this knowledge that the sensei is trying to pass down to her. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we came to tell this story. <laughs> Uh, Jesse, maybe you want to add to that? <laughs> no, I don't have much to add. I think just, you know, why this specific dojo, I think what really drew Sarah and I to it is the, um, the kind of central question of gender that it plays within not just its own community, but also within the broader fabric um, and historical backdrop of karate within South Africa. Because when Sensei flowers the the woman in the film when she started off doing karate um that was during a time when women were not considered fit to be doing the sport and in fact i, I remember during the interview she even said that her mother had said that karate wasn't a sport for girls and so um it not only speaks to a lot of the historical aspects of apartheid in south africa and karate's really interesting kind of place in that history but also it really started i mean in a way it's it's a form of you know gender protest really um the way that the sensei started off you know as one of the very the only women really practicing karate at the time and how this dojo has really blossomed into um it's really blossomed into very much a matriarchal space um most of the people there most of the students, most of the people who run it are women. And you see, I mean, like Sarah said, the very first day that we were there, when we saw Noir for the first time, it was just all young girls. And it was the most amazing thing to see because also it was young, it was young Muslim girls in a lot of whom were practicing in their full hijab, which also is another cultural aspect of, you know, the inclusivity and also just yeah, just the the inclusivity of the space and kind of creating not just a safe space to to teach young women and girls self defense, but but also really as a as a vehicle for you know showing young girls what they can do and that it's not just a sport for boys too. Jesse, podrías muy brevemente explicarnos qué son los Cape Flats donde se lleva a cabo la historia. So the Cape Flats, um, historically during apartheid, during the Group Areas Act in 1957, it was one of the designated geographical locations where families um, of color, colored families and black families were forcibly removed. And within the landscape of the new South Africa, of course, spatial apartheid still lingers very much in the present. We all know this within a South African context. Um, and so the the Cape Flats is a very it's a very wide 
sprawling geographical location with various different um, communities and suburbs within that. And this Sari Dojo is within this, this location. And so uh, when you're speaking about kind of the, the legacy of apartheid and the geography of apartheid and the way that that functioned politically, um, it has a, a big significance because a lot of the families who were forcibly removed during apartheid still their uh, descendants and their family members still reside in these areas today. Y este tema nos uh, nos conecta también con la historia de de Kurt, con la película de No en mi barrio. Esta um, película cuenta historias de resistencia contra la gentrificación en Sao Paulo, Ciudad del Cabo y en Nueva York. Entonces eh, le quería preguntar a Kurt si puede explicar también un poco sobre el contexto donde se lleva a cabo la película, sobre todo el contexto local. Hay un barrio que se llama District 6 que sufrió también por este, por este decreto de, de división eh, racial. Sí, yeah, gracias. Um... So, so District 6 in, in the context of South Africa, well, you know, um, piggyback on what Jesse was speaking about earlier about the legacy and the history of um, um, spatial violence and apartheid spatial planning and, and, which, has a and which has a correlation to um, colonial, um, colonialism um, in South Africa. And um, so the history of, of District 6 is connected to a broader historiography about Um, forced removals, displacement, and, and the psychological trauma that basically um, is a result of that, which also speaks to the, the, the connection to the history of um, the Cape Flats and the, 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 the basic the architectural makeup of its space where communities of color are still dealing with um, um, the psychological trauma um, of apartheid, colonialism, slavery, etc., um, um, which kind of speaks to South Africa, but also kind of broadly to a, a broader kind of um, African continental uh, struggle for decolonialism um, um, and the fight against neoliberalism ultimately. And so um, District 6 really is a, a speaks to a, um, a specific um, memory and a geographical memory of people who live in that space for um, um, for, 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 for centuries, um, um, and at least it, it spans to over 150 years. And then with the Group Areas Act of 1950, um, communities basically were forcefully evicted. Um, and this community had over 100,000 um, um, residents in this space. But the emphasis on, on this specific locality is also connected to other communities who were also displaced and forcefully, forcefully evicted across South Africa. Um, um, we know about the story of, 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 of Sophia Town in Johannesburg. Um, um, we know stories about uh, Simon's Town in Cape Town um, and many other spaces. I mean, there's, there's the history of, obviously, the group years like the house, that's connected to, for example, the history of um, um, homeland, the homeland system in South Africa. Um, so the apartheid government itself um, um, And the apartheid project really is connected and directly correlated to the broader colonial project, um, which still manifests itself in post-apartheid South Africa. ¿En qué sentido sus documentales cuentan historias que son parte de un movimiento de resistencia social, especialmente en Sudáfrica, que es una de las de las sociedades más desiguales del mundo? Look, I mean, I don't know that my work or the documentaries that I make are part of social uh, resistance. I think that, I think as documentary filmmakers, we should always be asking questions, right? And uh, and I think often those questions are kind of, <laughs> you know, about the past. What has happened that led us to be here today? <laughs> and if we don't ask those questions, we can't propose anything different for the future. So, I mean, if that's part of social resistance, I'm not sure, but um, I mean, this is at least the way I see my work is I've, I'm curious about history. I'm also very saddened by it <laughs> because it's not, uh, it's not a happy book. <laughs> And I think it's important that we, that we look at, at it from a, from a place of truth and that we ask, we ask honest questions and that we try to have conversations that can push us forward in a better direction. Uh, so, 
I mean, I think in my films, I, I try to propose ideas like that. With this specific film with JC, I think we very consciously made a decision to make it a quirky film, lighthearted. Um, and I think that was to kind of counter the stories that usually come from the Cape Flats, which tend to be very negative. And we wanted to show a space, a community space that's beautiful, where people are kind to each other, where people help each other to become resilient. And that despite what's happening outside that space, in that space, um, it's possible to grow together. So I think that was for JC and I, it was very important that this film focused on the positive as opposed to the negative. So we gave just a little bit of the context of the dojo from the sensei's point of view. Um, so that we understood a little bit of the history of the space, but then we really just focused on the now and what happens in that, you know, between those four walls kind of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think there's, I think that, you know, that is maybe part of it as well. I think sometimes just telling stories from a different point of view is also kind of helping to those conversations, you know, how we represent each other kind of thing. Um, yeah, I hope that made sense. <laughs> I definitely agree. I think I, I also maybe see things a little bit differently. For me personally, storytelling is in itself an act of resistance, especially within the fabric of South Africa, where historically so much of our past is etched onto censorship and, you know, questions of what happens when stories aren't able to be told. Um, and so I think the very act of telling a story of choosing to, what to put on camera and to project it to the world. I think that that in of itself, irrespective of how maybe explicitly political it is, I think that is a incredible act of resilience and an act of, um, yeah, an, an act of political resilience. And so for me, that's personally how I see storytelling and how I see my work. Um, and also I, I think this film too, you know, it's interesting because Kurt spoke a little bit about how historical memory is embodied within architectural planning and within like a physical landscape. But, you know, history is also carried physically and embodied in bodies. And our film is very much an embodied film. It's about movement through a sport. And it's about, you know, what is passed down between generations of different women, basically. It's an intergenerational story of what karate means to these different women in this community through different generations. Um, and so through that, through that carrying down of, of memory through the body of that embodiment, there, there, there is also, I think, um, yeah, I think that there's also political statements to, to be said in, in of itself through that. And, you know, choosing to, to place a camera and to frame that in of itself to me is an act of political resistance. Ahora nos va a acompañar Ángela Ramírez, codirectora de la MUICA, quien nos va a dar un apoyo entonces con la traducción y con esta conversación. And I just want to um, pick up on, on Sara's um, um, comment on the idea that, you know, when we engage in, in the kind of the artistic expression of, of cinema and, and, and storytelling, um, you know, I'm, I'm very cautious of this idea of, saying that my works you know speaks for within the broader context of 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 social movements and and the the plight against uh, the fight against global capitalism and 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 a lot of these films that we make is very personal to us and is dear to, dear to us so for me the premise of of my um The premise of making films that speaks about resistance, uh, resilience, and people basically, you know, um, um, fighting for the right to, to to remember and to retell their own historiography and their own stories of struggle and resistance. And um, you know, for myself, you know, having grown up in Cape Town, um, a settler colony, uh, probably one of the most unequal cities in in in, in the world, um, and more specifically, growing up in the periphery, uh, the Cape Flats. Um, um, you know, growing up with all these questions, philosophical questions and questions about also family, right? And my own family, you know, coming from a history of dispossession, uh, forced removals, um, um, I mean, the land being taken from them. And so, you know, I'm sitting with, the, with baggage, right? 
And so, yes, one could like um, rebel in 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 the, in the in the way in various ways, right? Um, for my for me personally, I feel like my rebelliousness really is correlated to the idea of um, using cinema really, you know, as as a form of of resistance. But also, more importantly, it's also I feel bro more broadly. I think having um, seen that South Africa's history is correlated to to the rest of the world, really, you know, for people who have gone through um, a history of dispossession, colonialism, slavery, um, and apartheid. Um, um, for me, it's also important to really think through this idea of transnational solidarity. Um, um, and so I think what's critical here is it's about how do we rethink that, how do we re um, restructure this concept of, of citizenship, right, and belonging. And I think in a, in a place in a place like South Africa, a contested space um, geographically, where the question of land is still a critical question, the, 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 the question about natural resources um, and whose history should be remembered, right? Um, so there's this friction constantly at play, right? And so for the filmmaker and the storyteller kind of eavesdrop, are eavesdropping really in these, you know, and within this, these critical um, conversations about democracy and belonging. So I think um, what I'm trying to do really is, um, one is, you know, um, troubling the frame, right? Troubling the kind of Western hegemony of cinema making and kind of this idea of, you know, being non-biased in storytelling. Yes, that's true. I mean, I think one as, a, you know, like the kind of ethical 101 of, of, of filmmaking is to kind of ask questions and, and kind of, you know, allow a so, the so-called protagonist and antagonist to then kind of contest, you know, what speaks through to power, right? Um, but it's also, you know, I battle with this idea that, you know, I am also from a community, right? Who are resisting or still continue to resisting right now. Um, um, and so how do I also then um, use, you know, uh, my voice and, and, and the medium I'm working in um, to speak um, within the broader construct of this idea of resistance, the idea of um, um, how do we think about restoration of memory? How do we think about the collective healing um, um, journey as well? You know, how do we enter, right? Um, for me, I'm at that starting point where I'm thinking through this idea of the collective healing process. And then using, for me, I think cinema for me is that is, is really the methodology um, um, to really think through the idea of, of healing. Y, y algo que me pareció también importante resaltar de, de su intervención a la hora de Kurt es que habla de, de la pregunta por, el, por, 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 por la tierra, ¿no? que, que siempre el, el debate en Sudáfrica o, o el centro de, de todo el conflicto eh, político ha sido a través del territorio algo que nos pasa mucho también aquí en Colombia. Y qué bueno que haces la mención a, a Colombia porque justamente quería, quería relacionar un poco el, lo que estamos hablando ahora, que es el contexto de Sudáfrica, un país que durante tantos años pasó por, un, por, por décadas por este régimen de la parte tan brutal y que luego en los 90 tuvo un, un proceso de transición a la democracia que tampoco fue un proceso fácil ni fue corto. Y en Colombia, que como pues nuestros panelistas saben también, eh, Colombia fue un país que durante décadas estuvo en un eh, conflicto armado muy sangriento, hasta que en, en 2016 se firmó un acuerdo de paz y en la conceptualización de ese acuerdo siempre se usaba Sudáfrica como, o de manera habitual se, se hacía referencia a Sudáfrica como un ejemplo de transición a la democracia, también se hablaba de la Comisión de Verdad y Reconciliación, de todos los procesos por los que tuvo que pasar Sudáfrica para, para llegar a lo que es ahora la democracia y esta llamada, muy entre comillas, Nación del Arco Iris, eh, que es un concepto pues un poco eh, romántico y que creo que se usa más fuera de Sudáfrica que en Sudáfrica misma. Entonces, en ese contexto quería pedirle a ustedes como como sudafricanos o Sara como una persona que ha trabajado y vivido en Sudáfrica por tanto tiempo, que nos hablaran un poco de, de esos desafíos que aún se mantienen, aunque la apartheid cae, cae oficialmente en el 94, aún hay unos grandes desafíos que son herencia de, de ese régimen. También para nosotros tomarlo como lecciones para el contexto en Colombia. Sí, primero, creo que, 
want to you know this state that you know um uh, we're in solidarity with folks in the streets right now in colombia um i've been you know just you know following you know what's been happening on the streets um you know through social media and obviously i think what's happening in colombia um you know we've seen that the rise of tyrants right and the, the rise of dictatorships and um, right wing, ultimately right wing politics, you know, throughout the world. Um, and so, you know, what in the context to like the austerity measures that's been happening in in in, in Colombia, but also, you know, there's the, the, the case study of Venezuela, for example, and there's you know the case study of of South Africa as well, obviously, right? And so. Um, I think one is that you know clearly you know the masses, the working class, the working people, have have have, have realized the only only way for 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 true justice is to resist, right? And um, and obviously having seen, for example, the case study of uh, Myanmar, um, um, you see the rise of these tyrants who basically wanna you know really stake claim. This idea, this obsession with power, but there's a long history, right, with this idea of obsession of power, um, um, which which directly directly speaks to, for example, you know, the role of the West, you know, in places like geographical spaces like Latin America. Um, um, so I think this question around reconciliation, right, is a very interesting one. I've been, you know, for 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 many years following. Um, 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 the story of FARC, right, um, in in Colombia, and you know that reconciliation process, right, and it it it, it could it reminds me of Unconte Sizwe as well in South Africa, um, when underground guerrilla forces uh, were basically ready prior 1994, um, just after I mean obviously had you know Nelson Mandela being being released. Um, and many other um, revolutionary movements in South Africa being disbanded, disbanded in South Africa. So MK was were waiting basically with their arms and basically, you know, saying, listen, we are ready. And, you know, you had the ANC basically who said, OK, you know what, let's talk to the enemy and let's negotiate. Right. And so, you know, you had various processes of, of you know, um, recon reconciliation, so-called reconciliation. Um, which ultimately a lot of people, you know, in South Africa um, speaks about this idea of the compromise, right? And, um, and you know, a lot of people, you know, in South Africa, and, you know, in the continent of Africa might even say that Nelson Mandela was a sellout, right? Um, and so this falsehood, right, of reconciliation in the context of South Africa and this rainbowness, right, the project of rainbowness that's been that has been sold to South Africans, which is really also connected this, to this, this amnesia effect as well, right? The, the idea of forgetting the past, right? And then being selective of what past we remember, right? And so, um, and that obviously, you know, if you really want to talk about, you know, the idea of we all want like peace, right? But we, we can't have uh, peace without justice, right? And so the question of justice and reconciliation is, Critical to the, you know, the, the kind of grassroots politics of South Africa, but again, as as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it, it it speaks to the rest, to what's happening across the world right now, right? Um, um, so, and then on top of it, right, we're also dealing with the pandemic, right, um, which speaks about the broader discourse around um, uh, inequality, um, which really, I mean, this virus ultimately is is, um, is exacerbated. Um, the inequality that we see. So, so coming back to the idea of how do we think through this idea of um, reconciliation, um, um, the ideas of also indigenous rights as well, right? And indigenous knowledge systems. So, you know, in the case of, of South Africa and Colombia, there's also this, there's an interesting um, um, correlation that one can draw that, that speaks about kind of this idea of, you know, um, who is the rightful custodians of the land, right? Now, indigenous people will tell you that we don't, we don't own the land, you know, we are here to protect the land, right? And so, you know, having seen this, the, the, the colonial project and the post-colonial project and the trauma and, and the intergenerational trauma 
that people both in, in countries like South Africa and Colombia have, have, have been dealing with. Um, um, at the same time, you have um, the kind of global capitalist project also at play, right? Playing its chess game at the same time. So really, it's it's. I mean, what I I mean, really, it's about this I, the obsession with material and 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 power, right? But you know, I'm a firm believer about you know about the collective and collective security, right? And for me, what's critical is this idea of you know people out in the street and resisting, and 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 I think. Um, there is something to be said about how globally right now people have the, the mighty giant have awakened, which is the masses, which is working people. So um, I think I'll, 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 I'll end my, my, my comment there, you know, but um, it's really just exciting time, I think, for myself as well, just witnessing these moments of resistance. I'd like to pick up on what Kurt actually said about... Um this sort of idea of almost like collective amnesia. Um, this is something that I think it's not just, it didn't just happen in South Africa. I think most countries that go through, you know, a process of revolutionary conciliation do tend to fall into that space because I think it's, well, first of all, because I think there's a dream and there's hope and you want to move forward to better things. Um, and perhaps you forget that you do actually need to sit down with the traumas and you need to heal those traumas before you can actually reach that dream properly. And I think that's partly what happened in South Africa, but not only in South Africa. I mean, I made the sign, the sign of masks in Mozambique and the process there was similar in that sense. It was just, it happened 20 years earlier, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think, I think it's, yeah, I, I mean, the way I see it, there's more and more people talking about what has failed in that process uh, and what needs to be done. And as Kurt said, a lot of it is, is collective healing. Uh, and collective healing can really only happen by speaking truth, <laughs> by looking at things for what they are, you know? And uh, yeah, going back to the issues of land in South Africa, for how many years have, been, have people been talking about it? It's not getting resolved, you know? Uh, all of those things need to start moving together. So I don't know. I don't know enough of the situation in Colombia now. I know that it's very bad. Uh, I don't know uh, in terms of how it's it might potentially get resolved or not. Uh, but I'm hoping that uh, it can be done through a more peaceful process than what you guys are witnessing right now. <laughs> um, and that you will find a better way moving forward where yeah where people can actually sit down and listen to each other and find common solutions as opposed to you know the tyranny we've been seeing in the world lately well not lately it's just <laughs> you know part of the world it seems <laughs> yeah i think that's that's what i've got to add it's i think we have to finish soon so thank you <laughs> bueno entonces pues eh, muchas gracias Jesse, Sara, Kurt, por acompañarnos, por sus respuestas tan completas, sus intervenciones y, por supuesto, por sus películas. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Muchas gracias, everyone. Muchas gracias, that's true. Pero antes, para despedirnos también, recordarles que La Muica es un evento que sucede cada dos años y que gira por diferentes territorios de Colombia para exhibir cine africano y para seguir construyendo o fortaleciendo mejor este puente entre nuestra realidad y del continente africano en general. Y este año hemos tenido unos retos bastante particulares de todo tipo y nos vimos obligados a suspender la mayoría de las actividades presenciales en Cali y Buenaventura. Estamos pendientes de lo que pasa en las otras ciudades del país. Esta edición de La Muica era su más ambiciosa con siete paradas en el país. Pero hemos mantenido la programación virtual en bunet.co totalmente gratuita. Y la idea es acompañar lo que está pasando en Colombia con estas reflexiones a través del cine y la cultura. No olviden las películas en bunet.co, en nuestras redes sociales, estamos en Facebook como Muica, muestra itinerante de cine africano, en Twitter e Instagram como arroba muica-cine. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Sí.